1046. Senate Bill 760. Senator from uh, Roanoke City, Senator Edwards. Uh, Mr. President, I move that the bill pass. And by way of explanation? Senator has the floor. Uh, Mr. President, Senate Bill 760 would provide uh, for those who are under the age of 65 and are on Medicare because of um, disability uh, health insurance. Um, Mr. President, we heard yesterday in the Commerce and Labor Committee uh, some riveting testimony about the need, the compelling need for this legislation. There are about 112,000 Virginians that are under 65 that are on Medicare disability, but they lack the opportunity in Virginia to have Medigap insurance or supplemental Medicare insurance to cover uh, their needs. Uh, there is one insurance company apparently in Northern Virginia, I think above Route 123 or whatever, that does provide this. And Mr. President, Virginia used to provide uh, Medigap insurance for this population of 112,000 Virginians. Um, Mr. President, a couple of years ago, for some reason, Virginia stopped providing this health, in health insurance. Mr. President, um, there are 29 other states in the, common, in the country that do provide Medigap insurance for those under age 65 and that are on Medicare disability. We heard testimony yesterday from a gentleman from Fredericksburg. He has a choice of keeping his house or providing um, uh, medication for his colorectal cancer. We heard his testimony, and you could hear a pin drop in the kind of testimony he gave. You, we heard the testimony from his teenage son and his teenage daughter. Uh, we also heard uh, support from agencies or organizations such as AARP and the Area Agencies on Aging and the Poverty Law Center. And many, many Virginians have come forth about the compelling need for this kind of insurance. It is now not available. It's not available in Virginia, uh, for most of Virginia. From, uh, for those under the age 65 that are on Medicare disability insurance. Mr. President, I would hope that the body would agree to support this legislation. There's a great need for it. There are people all over the Commonwealth in every district of the Commonwealth. You probably have gotten some emails on this. And with that, I renew my motion that the bill pass. Thank you, Senator. The Senator from Franklin, Senator Stanley. Thank you, Mr. President. Speak to the bill. Senator has the floor. Senator, um, the senator has brought this bill as noble in his efforts, Mr. President, and I think certainly Senate Bill 760 is a noble cause. But what we have to understand, and, and I listened to the testimony in the Commerce and Labor Committee yesterday, and it was compelling. An enormous amount of sympathy for the gentleman who is suffering with a terminal illness, uh, who testified that, that because of the lack of having this gap insurance, and that costs for his care were increasing. But then when I looked at the bill and I saw what we're trying to do is expand and create a mandate uh, for what is uh, no more than around 100,000 people in Virginia, I realized that the cost of this expansion, the cost of this gap coverage would be astronomical. And that likewise, that gap insurance would affect everyone else's premiums as well, negatively. Upon further reflection, I, I found that back in September 12th of 1990, there is a Special Advisory Commission on Mandated Health Insurance Benefits, Guidelines for the Review of Legislation Mandating Health Insurance Coverage. This body established the Special Advisory Commission on Mandated Health Insurance Benefits, an advisory commission. And in that, Mr. President, we have had adopted steps in the review process to review these bills which mandate this kind of coverage. And quite frankly, Mr. President, then when I reviewed this outline, this procedural guideline adopted by this body, I, I had even more concerns because the first thing that's required, Mr. President, is that a bill such as this, which is a mandate, is taken to the standing committee, which would be Commerce and Labor, and then Commerce and Labor would refer this bill to the Advisory Commission for review, which then would look at what the cost is going to be, what the impact, and who's it's going to affect. 
and how, good, how much good it's going to do and how much risk may be there as well. So, Mr. President, my concern is that this is a little bit premature. As good as this bill can be, and the good that it is trying to accomplish, and believe me, I voted to report. Further study makes me believe that this, this bill right here, Senate Bill 760, Mr. President, needs to be uh, re-referred back to Commerce and Labor, where we can send this to this advisory commission. We can get these answers we need, and then we can make an, uh, a valuable uh, decision on a very serious matter. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator. The Senator from James City County, Senator Norman. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I rise in support of what I think was a motion from the Senator from Franklin to re-refer the bill to the Committee on Commerce and Labor. The Senator from Franklin was absolutely correct in his recitation of what has been the tradition and the policy decision of the Senate for quite some period of time. Not too many years ago, there was a whole flurry of bills that were introduced, and all of them very uh, altruistic and deserving of consideration under some exigent circumstances. Some of the members of the body that were here a few years ago recall one of our former senators uh, who had a family member that had died from a form of cancer where there was an effort to try to uh, enact a mandate about certain cancer screening, made a most compelling argument, and at that time, uh, that senator was also suffering from a, a terminal disease. There's a reason that the Mandated Benefit Commission was set up, and for us to start circumventing that and requiring that there be mandated benefits and insurance policies without any consideration whatsoever is just not a good policy approach, regardless of how compelling one individual's exigent medical circumstances would be. And further, Mr. President, I would say it is just not a good precedent to start. Soon as we carve out an exception on something of this nature because the heartstrings of our heart are being pulled, and I, I have enormous empathy it is very difficult to tell the next senator or the next member of the House who comes forward with a bill to mandate a benefit and try to distinguish why we are going to send that bill to the mandated benefit commission, but not this one. And the senator from Franklin is, for once, absolutely correct. Thank you, Senator. The junior senator from Virginia Beach, Senator McWhorter. Thank you, Mr. President. Speaking to the bill just for a second, I know we're going to perhaps do something with the bill in a minute, but... Uh, speaking to the motion, Senator. Speaking to the motion. Thank you, Mr. President, for clarifying that. You know, uh, while there's uh, a lot of uh, good reason, we heard great testimony, I think that uh, what often happens in these decisions is we, we end up blaming the insurance companies or blaming the insurance industry. And it's really just an actuarial process, a number process that these companies look at when deciding whether or not to provide coverage and to provide products uh, for individuals. And while I'm sure 26 states have, uh, have enabling legislation in place, that doesn't tell us if anybody's signed up or is buying any of these products because we don't know what the numbers are, particularly with this population. And the reason is that it's a small population and their cost is very high and only a small group of people uh, will even qualify within the population. And so even if we had the product in place, the pricing would be so high, no one could afford it, at least in the quick kind of back of the envelope evaluations I've done and then some of the discussion I've had with the industry. So while it's a good idea, if the product's ever created, those who need it most will not be able to afford it. So I hope the commission will look at that. And I hope that as we look at these kinds of bills, as we look at insurance regulations and legislation, it's not unlike what we did with the Affordable Care Act. We rushed to do it and not thinking of the unintended consequences. And the unintended consequences in this could be the 300,000 or so people that do have Medigap insurance that are 65 and over in Virginia, their premiums could go up so high that we'd be in testimony next year or the year after from individuals saying, I used to have insurance until you guys did something to it. In fact, Mr. President, that was a testimony of this gentleman. 
I used to have insurance until my premiums went up so high, less than a year ago, I couldn't afford it. Now, I didn't have the, uh, it wasn't appropriate, and no one would have asked uh, the details of what happened. But many Virginians have lost their insurance because of the ACA for these very same mathematical reasons. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator. The Senator from Roanoke City, Senator Edwards. Mr. President, <clears throat> you've heard stories, uh, arguments that the premiums would go up. Obviously, some people may not have read the bill. We've, we made a number of changes in the committee. One of the changes has to do with line 31 and 32. An insurer may develop premium rates specific to the class of individuals described herein. That means that these premium rates, and the Affordable Care Act allows this, and Medigap Insurance, a, a carve out for underwriting for this particular class, for this group. Therefore, those who have Medigap insurance over 65, their premiums would not be affected. That was the argument against it uh, with the insurance carriers. We've carved it out. So that won't happen. A separate classification. And of the 112,000 people in Virginia who are under 65, who, would, who are on Medicare uh, disability who would qualify for this, and this is the category we're talking about, 78% of those, I'm told, have, have disabilities that are stabilized. They wouldn't be that expensive. 22% have more expensive issues, such as this gentleman who testified yesterday. So it's doable. And in fact, a lady who came from Roanoke who gave me the idea of the bill last fall is on is under 65 on Medicare disability. Her she actually got the insurance before it terminated in Virginia, and she continues to have it because she continues to pay the the premiums. And the difference between what people over 65 are paying for the similar insurance and what she's paying is over 65 they're paying 146 a month. She's paying 315 a month, a little more than twice as much but not 10 times as much, not what the figures some people have been throwing around. And given the fact that this is narrowly tailored to deal with this population and not affect anybody else's premiums, Mr. President, this is very doable. And I ask the body to go ahead to um, renew my motion, uh, well, to first deal with the motion to recommit and vote no on the motion to recommit. This was worked over by insurance, by the committee yesterday, it needs to go down to the House, where we'll continue working on it in the House of Delegates. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator. The Senator from Powhatan, Senator Watkins. Mr. President, speaking to the motion. Senator has the floor. Mr. President, I urged the good Senator from Roanoke early on in this session, when this legislation came forward, to please bring to me changes and modifications that would be required within this legislation. I urged him on three different occasions at three different meetings of the committee. The last two amendments, the one that he spoke of and another one, were done literally on the fly in the last 20 minutes of the meeting that we had yesterday. Nobody, nobody has any idea what the real impact of those amendments was. It is an assumption on his part that they improved, and maybe they did, but maybe they didn't. There's also an arbitrary decision that has been made in this statute that takes out one whole class of these folks that are, would become dependent upon something like that. End stage renal disease is excluded. It's not included in this. It also goes in, and one of the amendments that at the last minute that was put in was a change in how the insurance broker's fees are charged whether well, it would be on a percentage, as they are in all of these plans, or whether it would be a flat fee. These are arbitrary decisions. These are the kinds of decisions that the Health Insurance Reform Commission examines and provides us input on. And, Mr. Chairman, that's where this needs to go first. We have traditionally, ever since 1990, taken all bills like this for this very reason and sent them to this commission to be reviewed and sent back to the General Assembly for a decision. 
at least with the review, we would, we would know what the cohort of people is. We would know what the cost could be estimated to be by professionals. And it wouldn't be a guesswork. I'm afraid we've got guesswork here. It's well-intentioned, and the compelling case that the one gentleman who testified yesterday was heart-wrenching, no question about it. But we can't afford to put something out there, put a mandate out there with not knowing what it's going to cost and who it's going to affect. And I ask you and would reinforce the request by the gentleman from Franklin uh, that we send this bill back to committee. As chairman of the committee, it would be my intent to put together a letter and send it to the Health Insurance Reform Commission and ask that they come back so that next year it can be dealt with. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. The Senator from Roanoke City. Mr. President, we're, we're just barely halfway through the session. As everybody knows, it's got to go through the other body, maybe in conference. And I've told the industry I'm committed to working with them on this. In fact, we've made a number of compromises with the committee, the uh, insurance industry, including end-stage renal disease, which is very, very expensive. That was taken out to keep the price down to make this doable. Again, I urge the body not to recommit it to committee because that would just kill it, and everybody knows it. Thank you, Senator. The motion on the floor is to recommit Senate Bill 760 to Commerce and Labor. All in favor of the motion will say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. No. The ayes have it. The uh, bill is recommitted to Commerce and Labor. Seeing eight hands, there will be a recorded vote. All in favor of agreeing to the motion to recommit to Commerce and Labor will record the votes. Aye. Those opposed, no. Are the senators ready to vote? Have all the senators voted? Do any senators desire to change their votes? The clerk will close the roll. Ayes 21, no 17. Ayes 21, no 17. The bill is recommitted to Commerce and Labor.